morning and welcome once again to Worship with Nottingham Arnold's Salvation Army. Lord bless you. We're pleased you can join with us for worship this morning. And we're pleased that we can see signs of progress amongst us. Uh, we're glad that the days are getting a bit longer. Um, while we're filming this, it's a nice sunny day, but uh, it's supposed to change over the weekend. But there are flowers starting to, the little shoots starting to come up. And millions of people in the UK have been vaccinated, some of them in our congregation. So we praise God for the light that we see. Yeah, we're really, really pleased about that. It's exciting days yeah. ahead. There, there certainly is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and within our video uh, today, we're going to be uh, looking at some of the work of the Salvation Army in other countries. Every year we're provided with the opportunity to, to support financially our brothers and sisters in Christ uh, around the Salvation Army world. Uh, we call it self-denial. Uh, so we begin over the next few weeks now looking at uh, videos of the work of the Salvation Army in different countries. And then in March, there'll be an opportunity for us to give in a serious way uh, to support the work of the Salvation Army. So that, that'll feature in our videos over the next few weeks. Great. Now, would you like to join with us for our call to worship? It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. For, for you, you, O Lord, Lord have, have made us glad by your work. work. At, At the, the works, works of your hands, hands let, let us sing, sing for, for joy. joy. Amen. 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 So let us sing for joy just now. Let's bless the name of the Lord at the start of this day, set aside to worship him. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sin like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again.
grace for all who will believe. We will stand on every promise of your word. Let us come together to pray. Light of light, Lord of lords, God of this world and the next, we give you thanks for the promise of this day. We give you thanks for the challenge of this day. We give you thanks for the blessings of this day. Light of light, Lord of lords, God of this world and the next, we give you thanks. Thank you that in worship we can put aside the uncertainties of this world and the rest upon the certainties of the kingdom, for your promises are not changeable, but immovable and eternal. Thank you that we bring to you all the hurts and fears that trouble us, and leave them with you, knowing that your strength and assurance are all that we require. Thank you that as we draw near in worship, we are moved from a world of concerns and fears to a place where we can be at peace in your presence. Find healing, wholeness and refreshment. Thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity of worship. Amen. Now let us join together in the Lord's Prayer.
Today's Bible reading is verses taken from Mark 3 and Mark 4. Crowds follow Jesus. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard all he was doing, many people came to him, from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around the Tower and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell who he was. A lamp on a stand. He said to them, Do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, do you put it in a stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. If the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what he has, will be taken from him. The parable of the growing seed. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, nice and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself the soil produces corn, first the stalk, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But as soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. The parable of the mustard seed. Again he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds of the air can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them, as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable, but when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. Amen. Hello and welcome to the first of our films for this year's Self-Denial Appeal. My name is Ben Cottrell, and as we live through the various lockdown measures in place across our territory, I'm going to be looking beyond our borders. For this year's self-denial appeal, I'm going to focus on some of the places we've featured in previous appeals and catch up with people we've met along the way to find out how they've been coping during the pandemic. But first, let's look at last year's appeal. Last year we travelled to the city of Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso. We met Andre and Nana Togo and saw some of the amazing things that they're doing there. We saw a thriving corps full of enthusiastic new soldiers and we saw how the Salvation Army is supporting people in the local community. You gave generously once again. Thank you so much. Your self-denial money is already being put to good use. And as a little reminder about how self-denial works, here's Ashley Bowles, who presented our films a couple of years ago. The money you gave through self-denial is used to support the mission of the Salvation Army around the world, including our mission partners. The idea of self-denial was first introduced in London by William Booth in 1886. He said, go without something and give what you would have spent to the Salvation Army's work. That was over 130 years ago. Now, nearly every Salvation Army Corps the world over plays its part. So if you are giving in London, Clanethley, Larne or Lockerbie, you are joining with Salvationists in Oslo, Ohio or Ouagadougou, which is the capital city of Burkina Faso. The money is redistributed by international headquarters to the places that need it most. It funds the background things, the not so exciting but essential things, so that Salvation Army staff and volunteers can get on and do what they're good at, like the work in Burkina Faso. Well, as Ashley has reminded us, some of the self-denial money you raised goes to our mission partners, but quite a lot goes to other mission support work all over the globe. 
Mission support was crucial in enabling the work in Burkina Faso as the seedling Salvation Army took root and began to flourish. For over a year, I've had the privilege of working for the International Development Team at Territorial Headquarters. It's given me a further insight into the international work of the Salvation Army, and I've been involved in some of the projects which have been funded by self-denial. I live here at William Booth College with my wife Rebecca and our two children. In a few weeks' time, we'll be moving to a court in East London. But this time last year, we were waiting for visas to go and work in Pakistan. Like so many other people around the world, our plans were disrupted by the global pandemic. Of course, lots of people have faced real hardship, and while it's been frustrating for us, we are well and healthy, so we are grateful for that. As we adjust to this change for us, and as we think about self-denial, I want to find out about how the Salvation Army around the world has adapted. So for the next five weeks, we'll be revisiting some of the places we've been to before. I'll be asking people how they're coping and what life is like where they are. I'll be talking to Fozia Columbus in Pakistan. She featured in 2016 when Kerry Koch visited the Salvation Army's territorial headquarters in Lahore. I'll be talking to Melinda Boone from the Philippines. Melinda features in the Salvation Army's Helping Hand Appeal films from last year. She works in anti-human trafficking. I'll be talking to Richard Bradbury. Richard and his wife Heidi have been serving in Bangladesh for the last two and a half years. They're there with their two children and work at headquarters in Dhaka, the country's capital. But next week, we'll pick up where we left off last year. I'll be talking to Nana Togo, who we saw in Burkina Faso. I'll look forward to seeing you then. Everybody loves a good story, whether that's a best-selling novel or a dramatic television series or a, or a mesmerizing film. We love stories that draw us in and lead us down a particular path, and we want to know the direction that the story is going to go in. A few years ago, I watched an absolutely wonderful film about two rival magicians, and their lot in life was try, to try and see whether they could kind of outwit the other magician to, to be the best magician around. And as the film progressed, their, their tricks got more complex and more clever and certainly more dangerous. But one of the magicians had something special about him that the other magician just could not figure out. He couldn't figure out how he was doing some of the tricks. And, and the viewer was the same. We didn't know how he was managing to do what he did until it was revealed to us. And, and, and the twist came. And we're like, ah, now I see. Uh, and all of a sudden, what was hidden had become revealed and it made a lot more sense. And, and the, the story just took a, a new direction. Well, I watched that movie again just a couple of months ago with someone, and uh, as I was watching it, they hadn't seen it before, uh, but I had, and I knew what was coming, I knew what the twist was, and I have to say, I enjoyed the movie even more the second time around. Y you see, I knew what to look for, the little phrases and the, the actions, the, the, the looks, the things that were happening, but I knew, ah, what is hidden is being revealed, and I can see it this time. I can see what's happening. Now, I'm not in the slightest suggesting that Jesus was a magician, not at all. I simply use that movie as, a, as an illustration of things that were hidden and revealed, because that's what we're going to see in this text in the Gospel of Mark today, things that were hidden and are becoming revealed. Can you see it? Do you see it? Do you perceive it? So as we look at this passage from, from the Gospel just now, we're going to start off by looking at some of the groups who seemed to be around Jesus at that time. Some of them seemed to know who he was, and, and others had other questions and concerns about who Jesus was. So let's start by looking at some of those groups. If you go on to, to read the whole of, of chapter 3 of Mark's Gospel, please do find some time today to do that, you will find that in just a few short verses, Mark uh, highlights all the different groups who want to be around Jesus, all sorts of different people. There are the crowds who want to be near him, they want to touch him, they want to be healed by him, they want to hear from him. There are the disciples who want to learn from him. 
there are the religious leaders and the teachers who are making accusations against him. And there's also the family of Jesus who simply want him to come home. All of these people around Jesus perceiving him in different ways. There are even unclean spirits. Each of these groups are watching and seeing and responding to Jesus in different ways. Some of them understand what he's saying and they want to be a part of his kingdom that he's speaking about, that Jesus is proclaiming the kingdom of God is near. And others, well, they don't, they don't buy a word of it. They think this man's a trickster. He's dangerous. He's a, he's a madman or something even worse. But there are those who, who seem to, to understand the actions of Jesus. And it seems to be the unlikely ones who get it. They, they get the reality of who Jesus is, and it, it seems that he's been revealed to them. And the more they know, the more that they want to know. Now, obviously, Jesus isn't intentionally hiding himself from other people. He's not revealing himself to some and staying hidden to others. He, he couldn't do that. There's no way he could do that. Jesus is who he is. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He can be no other. But just as there are those who saw who he was, there are others who didn't. As Jesus said, let those who have ears to hear, let them hear. And maybe what he could have said is, let those who have eyes to see, let them see. We're talking spiritually now, of course. It reminds me of what Paul wrote in Ephesians, where he speaks about the eyes of our heart being enlightened and opened. But for those who kept their spiritual eyes closed, and they weren't willing to imagine that the person who stood amongst them was the one that they were waiting for, well, Mark quotes Isaiah when he says, they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving, and ever hearing, but never understanding. What is amazing is that the very people who spent their lives studying the scriptures and waiting for the Messiah didn't recognize him when he stood right in front of them. He was in plain sight, and yet to them he was hidden because they chose not to see him. I wonder, would you have recognized Christ if you saw him? Perhaps what is even more amazing is those who did recognize who this was. Uh, the, the, the people who saw that this is Jesus the Christ. And not just people who recognized him. One of the benefits of sitting down and reading the whole of the Gospel of Mark all the way through is you get to see the actions of Jesus repeated again and again and again. Now, every time I speak to you during this series, I'm going to recommend that at some point you sit down and you read the whole thing. It'll take less than two hours. You, you can do it. Spend in one day reading the whole of the Gospel of Mark. As I did that, I was amazed to see very early on in Jesus' ministry, how time and again he was casting out demons. He was, he was casting out unclean spirits. This is a fascinating area of our faith that we don't really talk about very much. Maybe it's because it makes us feel a little bit uncomfortable. And maybe it's because we think, well, perhaps we should diagnose it as, as some other phenomenon. Or maybe it's because, well, it might just concern us or... Maybe it's because we simply don't see it. Paul, again, when he's writing to the Ephesians, says this. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. That is to say, the human experience around us, the, the physical world around us. That is not what our struggle is against. He goes on to say, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That makes me think that just because we don't see it doesn't mean that it's not there. If our spiritual eyes are opened, we might just view aspects of this world in different ways. Now, that's not to say that there are devils and demons lurking around every corner. 
I think it was C.S. Lewis who once said that we often have a problem with this issue and we view it in two kind of opposite ways. First of all, we think that Satan is in every single bad experience that happens and we say that that must be Satan. Well, that's not the case, but Satan doesn't mind you saying that. He gets the credit for it when he doesn't even have to do anything. And then there are others who say, nonsense there is no such thing as evil and and darkness within this world well satan likes that too because he can get away with all sorts of stuff without being noticed and we have to find somewhere in between where we recognize that in this dark world there are spiritual forces unclean spirits those who would seek people out specifically seek people out to defile them to make them unclean, to destroy the good creation that God has, the beautiful person that God has created, and they are made unclean by an unclean spirit. Not the person themselves, but the spirit. So in this encounter with Jesus, the unclean spirits recognize who Jesus is, even from a distance, and they are quick to call him on it. They are quick to name Jesus for whom he is the Son of God. He is clearly revealed to them. But Jesus tells them to be quiet and not to tell anyone who he really is. Now, I wonder why Jesus says that. That's a great question. Why don't you think about it over your Sunday lunch today? Do you remember how Jesus started his public ministry? He stood and he proclaimed, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. That which is hidden is now being revealed. This is the mystery of the kingdom. You might not see it just yet, but it is here. It is here. And so the way that Jesus explained this is he would tell short stories, parables, ways of engaging the listener to, to, to listen to, to a story that fascinated them. And he spoke about how the kingdom was being revealed. So he spoke about lights, that a lamp it sh it shouldn't be hidden, but it should be seen. He, he spoke about seeds planted in the ground, hidden, but then to be revealed. Of course, the, the, the purpose of a seed is not to remain hidden in the ground and unseen. The purpose of a seed is, is, is to grow and be seen and produce a harvest. And, and likewise, the purpose of a lamp is, is not to be hidden, it is to shine. <laughs> let those who have ears to hear, let them hear. We did a sermon series a little while ago about the parables of Jesus or some of these stories that he told. So I'm not going to go into any detail just now, uh, but it's worth, again, reading the scriptures and asking for yourself, well, what do these parables mean? What are they saying to me today? What do they say to the people who originally were listening to them? But suffice to say that, that Jesus spoke in, in parables, as he often did, and it was always about the kingdom of God. He used language that was accessible and, and understandable, revealing more and more of what God was doing in and through him in the world that he was surrounded in. These are the stories that he told. These are the parables. This is all about the kingdom of God. And what is interesting is that Jesus often left it to the listener to fully interpret what he was saying. Let that message grow deep within the hearts, like a seed that had been planted. Uh, some people never seem to fully understand. Uh, perhaps they were only there for the miracles and, uh, and the healing. They, they didn't really listen to what he was saying. Other people did understand what Jesus was saying, and it wound them up. They got indignant about it. They were infuriated because they thought that some of his messages was directed at them. Uh, meanwhile, there were others who did have ears to hear, and they grasped what was being given to them. And the kingdom of God grew within them and their eyes were opened to see the kingdom all around them. The kingdom of God has come near. Even today, we find ourselves needing to search for the things of God, to find for ourselves how the kingdom of God is here. You see, sometimes it doesn't feel like it. 
sometimes it feels like everything is, is hidden. But just because we don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. The kingdom of God is near you. The old hymn writer, Charles Wesley, he, he penned such a, a wonderful phrase where he says, Oh, disclose thy lovely face. Now, isn't that a beautiful prayer? Oh, Jesus, reveal yourself to me today. I want to see you. I, I want to know you. I want to be reassured of your presence. So can I suggest that you make that your prayer each and every day? Oh, Jesus, reveal yourself to me today. Let me see your kingdom here amongst us. And so we pause and we pray and we ask Jesus to do that just now. Oh, disclose thy lovely face. May the Lord bless you. Allow me to pray for you just now. Lord Jesus Christ, won't you reveal yourself to us? Won't you reveal yourself to those who are watching and listening today? In these days of darkness, in these days of fear, in these days of uncertainty, 
Lord, may our eternal hope be in you. May we see your kingdom come and your will be done amongst us and around us. Oh, disclose thy lovely face, O Lord, to each who watch today. Make them aware of your presence this day and this week. And Lord, may as we know more about you, may we say more and more thy self-display shining to the perfect day. Amen. such good news that God is faithful to us and his promises are yes and amen or amen yeah. <laughs> either is fine God understands it's all right <laughs> yes or not indeed look we hope that uh, you will draw near to Christ this week he'll reveal himself to you in some really special ways uh, and that you'll be fully blessed by him and now for our benediction 
Now may the peace of Christ rest upon you, the faithfulness of his love remain with you, and the promises of his presence follow you this day and forever. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week with Jesus. We're looking forward to seeing you soon. Faith.